Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual roundtable, Supporting Black Community Members. This program is part of a broader mental health series that ACUI is offering in partnership with NURSA and in collaboration with AUCCCO, the Association for University and College Counseling Center Outreach. Um, your membership dollars fund today's program and all of our efforts in this space. We sincerely thank you for your support and for being here with us today and every day. Um, my name is Holly Stapleton. I'm the Chief of Staff at the Akuai Home Office, and I will be your Technical Director today. Today we're joined by an outstanding panel of professionals who bring a variety of perspectives to this conversation. Before I pass the program to today's moderator, I want to go over a few quick housekeeping tips. The first is just to note that these virtual roundtables are designed in conversation format as opposed to a traditional webinar. We see these programs as an opportunity for all to engage, connect, and really be an active part of the program. So please be ready and willing to offer your questions and insights along the way. Um, a note on that, um, throughout the program, you'll be able to submit your questions using the Q&A button, which you can find on your Zoom menu. Again, please feel free to submit these as we go along. Um, as you enter these questions and comments, please know that questions are viewable by all attendees and panelists. If a colleague submits a question that you would also like to be addressed, please be sure to upvote it so that it's flagged for us to ask live. The chat function is also available to you if you'd like to make a point of um, asking something of other attendees. We also recommend that you view this program using speaker view. Another function that you have available to you is the raised hand function, which allows for us to call on a member of the audience to ask questions in real time. Right now, I'm going to ask if you can see and hear us okay. Can you please raise your hand so that we know that everything is working on your end? Great. Thank you. So let's jump into the program. I'm now going to pass the virtual mic to today's moderator and a cool eye executive board member, Olin Garrett. Olin? Holly, thank you very much and uh, welcome to all of you that have joined us uh, this afternoon. I'm really glad you've joined us for this uh, very important virtual roundtable and I'm excited to be able to facilitate a conversation on how to support the well-being of, of Black community members on our campuses. I think it goes without saying that the last several months of 2020 have been particularly challenging for Black students, staff, and faculty, um, as if it hasn't been enough to just manage COVID-19 and the personal impacts uh, to members of our community, as well as the impacts to our campuses and communities. Uh, we've also experienced multiple incidents of anti-Blackness, racial injustice, and police uh, brutality. And I think those incidents have not only given rise to heightened racial tension, but they've also given rise to the amplification of voices through protests and unrest, and real discussions and calls to action within the broader higher ed community to dismantle systems of oppression and racism on our campuses and beyond. And I think these conversations, incidents, conflicts, and challenges are really likely to continue and intensify as we head into a presidential election season. So today we've assembled an outstanding group of panelists with very, with very perspectives on this topic. I'm actually going to ask each of the panelists to introduce and share a little bit about themselves. Um, and as they introduce themselves, I'd like to invite each uh, of our panelists to share a brief reflection on, on this question. Um, as we return to campus and we consider the various issues that will need to be confronted, what's weighing most on your minds right now and particularly for our Black community members? So I will um, uh, turn the floor over to our panelists and we'll start with Dr. Sean Blue. Hi everyone, I am a clinical psychologist and outreach coordinator at Jefferson. Um, I've been here for the last 10 years. Uh, Jefferson is a health professional school, so we have a medical college, a nursing program, uh, PT, OT, counseling. So we have a number of different um, health professional programs. We merged with uh, Philadelphia University uh, about two years ago. Um, and so we also have uh, East Falls campus as well. Um, in terms of concerns that I already have, I think I have a, a number of different concerns. I think. Um, as we all are just sitting with the ambiguity of not really knowing what's going to happen in the fall. I think that's tough around just really being able to plan um, services and um, how to support our students. So I think, you know, one of the ways that we're trying to figure out how to manage things is just how to provide a structure that really isn't there. Um, so I think that that would be my, my, um, 
first concern. My other concerns include um, some of the things that we talked about in the introduction, meaning uh, elections coming up and how that will affect our, our, our black students. Um, we've started brave conversations recently on our campus and one of the feedback that we get from students is that they feel like they're tired of talking and they want action. And so one of my concerns is how to support the students around um, seeing action on a campus when I think our campus is a bit slow about knowing how to really affect change on campus. And so how to help keep up their momentum in terms of wanting um, some change and some action, but also knowing that our school is, is very slow with that. Um, and so I think that that's going to be difficult. For our campus specifically, their schedules are, are very um, difficult. Um, and so how to offer services to them that fits their schedule, but is also perceived by them as helpful um, is, is uh, one other one. And then finally, just how to be helpful in a virtual hybrid of class and uh, virtual settings um, and, and, and providing services that is helpful to them is also another concern. So a number of concerns, but um, at least we're thinking about the ways that we can help them. Thank you very much for that. Uh, David? Hey, good morning, good afternoon. I'm in Central Time, so it's still morning for me. Uh, my name is David Davenport. I'm at Austin Peay State University, uh, where I get to serve as the Director of University Recreation. And currently, I, I sit on the NERSA uh, National, Emer National Emerald Recreation Sports Association as the board president. Um, been involved here at Austin Peay for 17 years. Um, I came in for a three to five year plan, and I'm still here. And um, I, I've served a different, couple of different roles at one point. Time, I actually served as Chief Diversity Officer as well as my Director of University Recreation role. Um, on those opportunities that the President needed somebody to fill it, she asked, could I do it? I said, I love the experience and it was an eye-opener for me where I, I got a gamut of opportunities from hanging nooses in the trees to dealing with um, parents who had issues in their own home and they expected us to fix them. So it became, it, it opened my eyes wildly for me and it also it put me in a place of knowing that is not what I want to spend the rest of my career doing. It was just so policy driven for me. I'm a programmer, I'm a student person, I'm a, a student affairs practitioner. So working with students is very important for me. So to be able to not to to, to not be in that 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 world hurt me. Uh, so I was looking for a job opportunity for that position to be filled permanently by somebody. And they started last July. And I still get to work with them closely, but it was in that realm. Um, I think that from a challenge or, or obstacle that we will face, uh, I will look at it two ways. One, professionally first, um, you know, being on this campus, being one of the senior leaders, dealing with budget constraints with COVID, dealing with, um, on my campus, there's not a lot of black men. So a lot of the young black men that come to campus, they come to me. So having to respond to their insecurities or their concerns um, and trying to be the answer end all be all, which is unfair for me, but that's the way people look at me sometimes and say, hey, do you have the answer? Or can you have the answer? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's where I am. Um, and then part of it is um, where um, I, I put myself in those situations and, and it's just not fair at times, um, but that's just reality for me. Um, so budgets, COVID, then you put the civil unrest and where we are, um, and then trying to open and return to campus, it all adds to some situations that makes it a, a huge challenge and obstacle for me. And that's the professional side. Mm -hmm. The personal side is obviously I'm a black man, but I'm a black man of two uh, young folks. I have a 25 year old son and a 20 year old daughter who this, this society has made me fear for them. I, I wonder, I'm concerned. I'm, I'm, you know, I want to protect them and I can't protect them every day. Um, we taught them well, my mother and I, and, and we hope that they just, we pray that they're always in a good situation, but it's, it's, it's unnerving, it's unsettling, it's hard to rest about it. Um, my son right now is actually in Vermont with work, um, mm -hmm. driving up 
you know, he wanted to drive himself. He did it, but I was still concerned that going through different states, what he would face, how he would face it. Uh, my daughter is 20. She's a college junior in North Carolina. You know, that's Charlotte is not the, the, the most proactive state right now, a uh, location for the civil unrest, and I'm concerned with her. And so it's, it's, it's a lot going on. So personally, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm unnerved and I'm, I'm losing a lot of sleep about it. Professionally, I have to be prepared and ready to conquer, and sometimes that's unfair. So it's a, it's a, it's a unhealthy balance act for me, but I have to try to provide a healthy opportunity for those who come to me about it. So that's where I am. Dude, thank you for that, Andrew. Hi, how are how are we doing? Um, I'm Andrea. I work at the University of Central Florida. There, I oversee our sport club program which is approximately 44 clubs, about 3,000 students participate in our program. I also oversee all of our adaptive and inclusive recreational efforts on our campus. And then I also oversee risk management. So three very different and broad, large areas. But um, on top of that, I get to serve with David as a NARSA board member. And at my campus, I actually serve within our rec center. We have our own diversity committee We've got a few committees and I, I serve as the chair of that diversity committee and I, I have for about five years now, as well as that has opened an opportunity for me to serve as a one of our team leads on our campus bias incident team. And as you may have guessed, the, the, the cases have definitely risen for us on that team. So what's what's really weighing the heaviest on, on my mind, it's a little bit of a two-pronged approach similar to David. The, the first from a professional standpoint, I honestly worry that with fall coming up for all of us and we're going through our reopening phases that the what's happening right now in our country, that black people are going to get forgotten about. I, I think it, it happens when there's this civil unrest and there's this push for change and then all of a sudden this something that is perceived to be bigger, which would be our fall reopening plans and everything that's happening with COVID, something comes along that's perceived to be bigger and that sustainable change is put on the back burner. So I, I really worry about that and I worry about it from the lens of, which is that other prong for me, which is I have to make sure that I'm not running out of steam while I'm doing all of this. So what can I do to ensure that that's not happening, not just on our campuses, but also within our NURSA association and, and, and anywhere else with my children, with my students. So I worry that I'm going to run out of steam just as everyone starts to put this on the back burner and I, we, we can't do that. Andrea, thank you for that. Um, as we get into the conversation, just a reminder, if you have questions out there that you're interested um, in asking uh, of our panel, we invite you to use the question and answer function to be able to uh, ask those questions. If you're interested, please feel free to uh, uh, identify yourself as part of that. I want to ask our panelists, you all have brought through brought about a number of issues to consider. Um, and David and Andrea in particular, you talked about this idea of having to navigate um, these situations, not just uh, and understanding how to maintain ethical care for all of that that uh, we work with and all that we support, but also having to navigate your own personal challenges and navigating this. And for many of us um, um, as black professionals, we are trying to navigate that while uh, at the same time trying to heal from our own trauma and figuring out how to deal with our personal challenges. Talk a little bit about how you have, have, have tried to navigate that. Talk about if there are uh, ways that we can support as professionals are our black community members who may also be navigating those kinds of issues. Andrea, I'll let you go ahead and start because I'm trying to change laptops. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew you were gonna, for some reason I unmuted. I knew you were gonna do that, David, but um, <laughs> so that's a very interesting question. And I, I struggled with this in early January where I felt I needed to be the one taking on everything and talking to everyone and helping everyone. And then I realized in the process, I was not taking care of myself and the things that were happening in my, in my home, um, specifically with my oldest son who had to deal with a couple of issues from a work perspective. So 
It's making sure that I had a circle of people around me who could fill my cup. So if there is any advice that I could give folks, um, I, I'm, I'm in this and I'm in this for the long haul, but not everyone is in the same space. Not everyone is at the same place in this, in this journey, in this work. And that's okay. It's, it's knowing, knowing and understanding that you may not be at that, at that place. So you may not need to be the one responding to whatever the situation is. And there were times where I had to say, nope, not right now. This isn't the one that I need to take because my cup is not full enough and I will probably not respond in the best way. So it's important to know that that's where you are at any specific time and to have a group of folks with you who are willing to fill your cup as well as you're willing to fill their cup as well. And I, I made sure that, that I had that, that group around me and made sure that I was filling other people's cups when they needed it. So I, I think I made a, a switch with my laptops. Okay. I hope it wasn't too much of a distraction, but um, I think to, to piggyback off what Andrea said is knowing when, um, how to respond and being able to respond when that, when that cup, when your cup is empty or too full. Um, one part that I, I've, failed to mention when it came to my role as far as uh, professionally as a nurse or president, it's a lot weighing on me as well from that standpoint. And mm -hmm. I say that to add to right here where I have to rely on other board members. I have to rely on nursing members. I have to rely on individuals to support me and what I'm going through. But for me as a man, a black man, it's hard for me to let that go. And I have to own it and let it go and allow individuals to help me because I am being affected as well. And that's hard to, to be vulnerable. So to, to be vulnerable is, is difficult, but I've learned to be okay with it. I don't know change that. I am learning to be okay with it. I haven't learned because I'm still struggling with it. So I would say to everybody, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to share your feelings. It's okay to say, hey, I need a minute. I need an hour. I need day i need a week um we've had to do that going through what we're dealing with today i've had to do it personally where i just had to take three or four days i just need time um and but it has to be a healthy time it can't be a healthy time um and the last part to that i would say it's okay to be angry the vulnerable part angry is okay is how you reflect that anger is, is that we need to be careful with. But um, at one point in time, I thought it was wrong for me to show that I was angry. About it. Mm -hmm. And I had to be reminded that it's okay to show your emotions. Anger is one of your emotions. Be okay with it. And once I did, I felt a little bit better. Um, I was too concerned about who was watching me. And once I got over that, I was okay. I felt better. Uh, I still concerned about it to a point, but... It, it is a true emotion. It's a raw emotion for me. And I have to be able to deal with not just the fear factor, but the anger part of it. And anger as a black man in this community is, is, is very easy, uh, but I have to be careful. I think you make a really important point about, uh, about vulnerability and about dealing with anger and dealing with emotion around this issue. I want to ask all of you. I want to um, maybe I want to direct the conversation to uh, to Sean, but maybe all of you can answer this question. As as you think about returning to campus, how are you and, and the rest of the counseling staff preparing for potentially enhanced needs for our Black community members, and how might support and outreach look different as we embark on this new normal? And then I I would potentially ask that question of all of you in the in the intramural recreation area as well. Uh, so previous, even before the, the recent um, racial unrest, um, I was in a position where I, we were uh, creating but also offering outreach to our students. Um, so we had a, a relax, relate and release for students of color. Um, I would often hold town hall meetings. Um, and so, you know, in terms of that structure already being present, that was already there. I think what we're doing now is um, what we've done over the summer and what we'll continue to do in the fall is to continue to have um, a place of support for them to come. And so um, we used to do it every other week, every month, but um, 
and when the fall starts back up, we're probably going to offer it every week uh, for our students um, just to have a safe space. A lot of our students of color feel like they're the only one in their program, the only one in their year. Um, and so having a, a good um, supportive place for them to come in a safe space and also to have um, someone in a, a place of leadership that they can see that is also of color, I think is helpful for them and they voice that that's helpful as well. Um, we also are trying to get feedback about what students specifically want and, and how they want to be supported. Um, and so trying to, to find better ways to, to figure out how to create a different additional spaces for them. Um, I mentioned before that uh, we're offering brave conversations um, on campus. Uh, those have been offered all summer. Um, I was trained in it, so I'll be offering it through the Counseling Center um, starting in the fall. Uh, we have some passive outreach that we're going to offer as well through social media uh, that we'll be also be doing. Um, so we're definitely, we, we've even revamped and tried to be more visible. We've always been a, a very diverse and multicultural um, counseling center, but we're trying to be more visible. We know one issue around um, issues around racism is that if you don't know that the policies are there, then it's almost as if you don't have them. And so we're just trying to be um, clearer about our stance on multiculturalism and that our counseling center supports that. Um, and so creating videos, creating um, literature that, that represents that better uh, has been our uh, strategy recently. It, sound, it, it sounds like you've, you've spent quite a bit uh, on time on really, uh, as a theme, two big issues. One is being clear about who you are and what you're about, and also, uh, and also creating space for individuals to be able to have the opportunity and presence. So very good, very good. We have a question uh, that's come into the Q&A from Jamaica Cannon. Um, uh, Jamaica's an inter uh, intramural sports professional that also works with varsity athletics. Um, the varsity athletic side has, has a clear path to addressing issues with student athletes taking an active role, but the IM side particularly uh, and Reckon in general on, on her campus doesn't have a path. So she has kind of a two-part question. First for Andrea, how did the team addressing diversity come about and what programming do you do or training? And then to everyone, um, there's concern about the campus diversity and inclusion office is inundated. So she wants to be able to move the, uh, move, um, uh, the ball forward within uh, I am in rec. So if there's any uh, resources or information, that would be helpful. So Andrea, why don't we start with the, the, the team addressing diversity and what programming you do training in that regard? Yeah, so we were lucky. It, it started from the top for us. Our director felt it was very important to have a diversity committee. So we have a committee for each of our goals in our rec center. And one of those goals is diversity and inclusion. So we, that was put together before I actually got there at the university 10 years ago. So it wasn't a, a trend to, to do that. Whereas I, I feel maybe right now, folks are doing it because of what's happening with the, with the unrest. So that was already in place when I got there. And it was an incredible feeling to get on this, to get in this department. And at the time when I was hired, I was the only black professional staff member. So to have to sit at that table at this diversity committee where I was the only one that looked like me, however it was developed before I got there, was, was an incredible and, and empowering feeling. And I had many, I've had many conversations with our director on that. So it, while it started at the top at our university, it doesn't have to start from the top. Honestly, Jamaica, I think if you are interested in, in creating something like that, we can, I, I can certainly have some conversations with you to do that. So with our diversity committee, we do a multitude of trainings in-house with our staff from a diversity perspective. When we do our staff trainings in fall, we have a diversity component with there. When we do our trainings with our graduate assistants, again, have that component. So it's infused in what we do at our rec center. And, you know, for instance, I oversee inclusive and adaptive recreation. That's all part of that group. And as far as trainings, I also served on our equity, diversity, and inclusion commission with NERSA. 
And we created this, this beautiful manual that's available for, for all NARSA members. And I would not have any reservations to, to share that electronically with you if, if you'd like to connect with, with me later. I, I think that the work that was done and, and shout out to all of our EDI commission members, it was, it was a lot of work. And, and David was with us when we went to the retreat, we, we spent a week together and, and from that week just kind of spawned all of these incredible ideas. And one of those ideas came, was that, was that manual. And it is designed for someone such as yourself who may not have those resources currently in your rec program. And it's to help you get, to help you get there. There's case studies, within there and there's at the beginning there's just lots of learning that folks can do so please let me know I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to share and then also our, I'll be happy to share our, our model what we do within our rec center we also have a philanthropy committee risk management team development and a healthy lifestyles committee I think that's very helpful um, I'm seeing some things come up in uh, the chat. A uh, question from Lance Haney, and, and Sean, this may be for you. How are you defining brave, uh, a brave conversation for the purposes of that, uh, of that initiative? So, of course, it's one of those questions where you know the answer and then you can't remember where it was originated. But I can't remember where Brave Conversations were, what university it was originated on. Um, but Jefferson, um, we just uh, hired a new... Um, Chief uh, uh, Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity uh, Officer, and so she's bringing those to our campus. And so they're just these open, supportive conversations. Um, we're using it over a virtual platform. Um, we have uh, kind of Jefferson copyrighted uh, slides that they have um, us follow. And basically, uh, we open it up to about 10 members on campus. Um, They've had a mixture of students and faculty, and then just some for faculty. And then um, my hope is that we'll just bring them just for students going forward. Uh, but just talking about um, how to be courageous when talking, how to uh, be open and honest, but also be respectful of um, what people are bringing to the table, even if it's different than your own perspective, um, to allow someone to finish their thought before um, speaking, um, to also be respectful of, um, you know, your nonverbal. So mm -hmm. leaving the, the video and then not coming back or um, leaving during a different, a difficult comment um, and having an empty seat on the video. So um, at the end, we offer, um, uh, in this, again, I think Jefferson added this piece, but a couple of statements about what you should and should not say. Um, I think they were getting a lot of questions about uh, what are helpful comments to say to individuals. Um, and then some resources. So, uh, of course, the Counseling Center, uh, our Employee Assistance Program, and then just some other um, Jeff, we call it Jeff Hub, which is our learning platform. Um, we have to take um, mandated uh, requirements each year. And so uh, this year they're adding in some diversity courses uh, for all employees to take. And so there's also some other educational resources on that platform for individuals. And so that's how our campus has adapted the, the Brave Conversations. Very cool. Thank you for that. Sure. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A from Leah Paulson. Um, are any of you going into a completely remote setting for the fall? And if so, um, what's your plan to support uh, students, specifically black students from afar? Um, i start off with that one a little. Um, one, so adding to the last question, here at Austin P, we've started, restarted an African-American employee council. Uh, we had a staff council, we have a faculty council, but we knew we needed to address the needs of our black faculty and staff. So we restarted that. Well, spinning off from that, we have a student portion as well, as well as the athletic portion. So um, early, I didn't mention, I'm on some, a couple of post COVID task force here at Austin P. Mm -hmm. One of the things we are implementing right now, we're going hybrid for the fall. Uh, some on, some off, but we have a plan to go all um, online when that time happens or when it needs to happen. And a, a part of that, we, we're partnering with our health department and uh, some of our counselor, counseling and testing 
folks to have um, student ready uh, online counseling sessions available and ready. Um, they've already they've already begun and they have the choice to say uh, that whether they want to meet face to face or online or what whatnot. And we anticipate that we'll be able to just convert to an online version once we if we deem that we cannot be hybrid anymore. Um, so we have a plan in place and we are practicing that plan. Uh, it will address our students, our black faculty, well, all faculty, but primarily our black faculty. And then, then we have a separate component for our student athletes as well, because their, their uh, situation is just a little bit more intense than, uh, and needs a little bit more specialization than um, um, our regular EDI office can provide in a, in a big picture. I hope I answered that question. Others, are you all going online as well? And, and if so, how are you planning to support students? Or if you have ideas about how to support students in a virtual format? We are going fully online as of yet. Um, again, as we know, this is extremely dynamic and things are changing every single day. Um, but what we're doing is we're trying to support students through the really the only platform that we know how is continuing the outreach that we do through our sports. I know right now esports is blowing up on a lot of college campuses. So specifically trying to narrow that down um, is a little bit difficult from a campus recreation standpoint. So what we're trying to do is we are really outreaching a ton through our student staff. I think that to me, sometimes those students get lost in the fold because we think of the broader student perspective. But I know when everything started happening uh, with, with all the unrest in June, that was, one of, that was one very intentional thing that all of my colleagues and I did was to reach out to our student staff, specifically our student, our black student members as well. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of earlier, I know we talked about how, what are we doing to, to support our students through all of this? But I think sometimes we forget a lot about our faculty and staff. So mm -hmm. I worry a lot about our professional staff and our faculty during all of this time. So we, we our, our universities are great at doing programming and outreach for our students, but we have to make sure that we are not forgetting about our staff because we are expected to show up every single day and do exactly what we're doing, which is the outreach for students, because that's our role. But at the same time, we have all of these personal things that are happening. So I, I know we are here for our students as well, but if we don't exist and if we aren't healthy, how is that going to happen effectively? Absolutely, that's an extremely good point. As we move on to the next question, I wanna let the, uh, um, I want to let our audience know that Andrea had talked about the NERSA uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Manual, and several of you have asked about that. Holly has posted um, Andrea's email address in the chat, and also a link uh, to that mail has been posted in the chat, and I want to thank all those who have contributed in case you were interested. We have a question out uh, from uh, Novia Ramsey, who, uh, who asked, for those who have a diversity offer, offer, officer on campus, excuse me, are they communicating with faculty, staff, and students of of color information as it relates to conversations being had with administration to change campus climate around diversity. Maybe speak to how, how transparent are your campuses being uh, in communicating information to, to, uh, uh, to members of the campus community around these issues. Uh, for Jefferson, our officer was just uh, hired, um, gosh, concept, during, uh, concept of time during this pandemic is, is always hard. Uh, I think she was hired in May or April, and so it was very uh, recent. And so she's been busy trying to um, just get on campus, get a, a climate of what's going on on campus. Um, and so I, I'm not clear about when the, the timing of, of uh, when that uh, communication will happen, but um, I, I think part of that issue is because of, of the timing of her uh, hiring. Um, her office is very, very visible. 
Um, for our campus, there's someone who's over, again, because we have a university, we have a hospital, and then we have the enterprise. And so um, we have different individuals who are over different um, levels. Um, and each individual is, is, is very visible. So for my campus specifically, um, that has not been given to us yet, but I'm assuming that that will be coming down the pipeline as she, um, you know, gets a better sense of the climate on campus. Um, here at Austin P, our, our campus has pretty, been pretty transparent, and I think that's been the proactive approach from a lot of our, uh, our diversity committee, our chief diversity officer, and our president as well. We have a very supportive and inclusive campus that um, we're, we're pretty transparent about what's going on. And, and as soon as uh, the, the civil unrest started again, because we, we had it before on our campus, we were able to start addressing issues immediately um, with a town hall and then some subcommittees or, or, or focus groups um, and putting plans in action. Um, communication has been, been a value for us here. Um, and many are pretty pleased about where we are because we're in the know, particularly with the civil unrest, but also with the COVID situation as well. So both, both those put together has allowed us the opportunity to be very transparent. And uh, our administration has been very open about it. And that's a plus on our end. I know it's not always like that or it hadn't always been that way here. But we've, we've been pretty fortunate in that standpoint with the transparency, uh, as, even as opposed to even it relate to we get daily updates on what's going on. So as a very large university, UCF is really, I, I think they're doing their best to try to get that information out and, and really get that out in a timely manner. Um, it, what's interesting is our, we have a brand new president and he sends updates via email at times and then we'll hear also from our interim chief diversity officer. So we'll hear from him as well. And what I've seen is lots of webinars, lots of um, round tables and, and such. And, and I think what's What's, what's, what I can see right now is it's not just coming from that office. We see it coming from our counseling center. We see it coming from the different departments from our division. So in a broader sense, they, I think they're doing it as best as they possibly can, but with a brand new president and, and interim chief diversity officer, they're, they're doing what they can to really try to navigate this while also navigating everything else. So it's, a, it's important. I think everyone's continuing to hold each other accountable. And I think that's the, that's the biggest takeaway from, from our university that I can see from, from my lens. Very good, appreciate that. I wanna go back to this concept of, of running out of steam that Andrea, you talked about and, and really particularly uh, in tune to the heavy lift that we as Black professionals are asked to, um, to assume both real and perceived uh, with respect to doing DEI work in elevated uh, times and elevated situations like these. Are, for all of you, are you preparing uh, your staff to talk to majority students about the current climate um, to encourage allyship and or to at least help them better understand the climate and what their Black student counterparts may be facing? I think that's the benefit of having a diversity committee that's been in, in practice for so long in our department. So I'll, I'll speak from our, our department because that's where I feel we are continuing to, to do the work and, and it's not just of what's happening in the right now. I think what's kind of forced some things to happen in the right now within our department is to get people to understand everyone has a completely different lane. And I read a quote that I found a while ago to, to some of my colleagues. And I just remember people saying, thank you for saying that because I, I'm not the person to go out on the front lines and protest, but I am the person that would want to pick up the phone call or pick up the phone and call their black male student directly and say, hey, I'm thinking about you. Please let me know if there's anything that I can do. So the advocacy piece isn't just in one lane. So I think what's really helped right now is to push it to the fact that you don't have to do it the same exact way that Andrea is doing it or that Sean's doing it or that David's doing it. You can do it in your way, 
but the bottom line is do something. And I think that that's been a, a big, a big trend right now within our department is do something. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Definitely from the counseling center uh, piece, I, I think that we are um, doing that even from our individual group in couples therapy, um, because we know that this is affecting um, our students on a very personal level, um, but then also through the outreach as well. Um, I'm also, as a clinical psychologist, I'm also in the Department of Psychiatry at Jefferson. And so as the diversity liaison of, of that department, we're also doing um, a, a lot of things there. Uh, I created a diversity committee. Um, mm -hmm. We've gotten um, buy-in to have some um, diversity related grand rounds and some lunch and learns and some other um, educational pieces. And so just kind of creating just a larger community around um, programming and uh, activities that will uh, sustain this this effort for change uh, within our with our, our community but in terms of also um, trying to advocate for our faculty uh, to be aware of the issues that their students are experiencing um, and to, to help them be better allies in supporting their students as well let me let me take this question and turn it around. Let me actually, Sean. Let me start with you on this. Um, thinking about how we are preparing our counseling center staffs and other folks to be able to work with black students and other professionals. You know, on, I think one of the things I am reflecting on personally um, is as we have navigated the last four months is for black community members who have always kind of had this eye on the prize and telling we have to push through and push through. One of the things that's really, really happening is people are saying, I can't do that anymore. We're showing vulnerability and humanity, which I think is really important. But on the flip side, we also know that there is still a little bit of a stigma when it comes to dealing with mental health and mental well-being, and in some cases, getting people out to counseling centers. Talk a little bit, about, if you can, about how we're preparing our, our fellow counselors or how we could prepare, help our fellow counselors to provide really competent care for our black community members and, and in turn how we're doing that maybe in our other areas. And maybe how we're doing that, how, what was oh, the last? Sorry, for our other functional areas as well, but I would invite you to talk oh, okay. about the center one first. I Sounds one. good. Yes, of course. Um, you know, again, it, it's just kind of working from a multicultural approach and just, you know, if you work from that approach then you all you often see everyone and their unique experience and what that brings um, mm -hmm. Uh, experience and so you know it was it was off it was very obvious to us that we needed to um, be really aware and to bring it into therapy and ask how people are doing with things even if they don't bring it up um, and so um, that has been something that we've always just been um, very aware of and, and felt mm -hmm. that that was necessary so in terms of um, either future counselors or current um, therapists and counselors. I think um, just keeping an ear out and, and, and checking in on people, figuring out what they need, um, soliciting feedback around um, what you maybe can offer, but then also having, um, I heard a lot about self-care today. I heard a lot about support, um, but also we as therapists of, of taking care of ourselves. I think one thing that's difficult is that we often hold a lot. So meaning, you know, a student comes in with any kind of life issue. If, if we've experienced that life issue, we often have to uh, hold what they're bringing in, but then also manage our own uh, interpersonal or intrapersonal processes. So mm -hmm. I think that that's been something that we've always had to do. And so this is no different. I do think that it, it, it is taxing to kind of hold our own um, experience, but then hold our, our, our students' experiences. So I would definitely recommend that everyone uh, reevaluate their self-care routine um, and figure out some boundary settings. Um, we have to say yes to every uh, request and um, or we, if we are volunteering ourselves, maybe we need to think about everything that we're volunteering mm -hmm. for. Um, and especially for those of us who are one of few, um, 
you know, again, it's a similar thing to students where uh, we're being overworked and then, you know, we're not able to provide care in the way that we need to. So just being um, really uh, aware of our needs and uh, that's really hard as a nurturer, as a person who's always trying to take care of everyone else, we often are the worst ones around that. And so just reminding ourselves the importance of doing that work um, because we can't help anybody else until we help ourselves. Absolutely. I don't want to share uh, that your comments are inside. We're getting some affirmations in the chat related to some of the things that you have said. So I really appreciate that. Um, question uh, that has been directed to David. Um, as a black man that's also a director, um, can you share a little bit of perspective on how white professionals that want to step up in this space and take some action ownership um, to help the exhaustion black professionals are, are feeling communicate that to you in a way that's respectful? Yeah, so first of all, I appreciate uh, ask, um, that question being asked because I think it's important. Um, for me, I appreciate those who, who are asking how can they can help. Uh, it's the ones that are not saying anything that are bothering me. The ones who are quiet are the ones that are, are bothering me. Uh, one of my good friends and, and uh, a good friend shared a long time ago that silence is compliance. So when, when those around me are quiet, to me, I'm, I'm interpreting that they're agreeing with whatever's going on. So to answer the question directly more, if, when they ask, can they help? The sincerity is there and to help, not just to be quiet about it. Ask the questions. I'd rather you ask and err on the side of offending me than they try to assume and be incorrect about it. Um, and But if you ask the question, be ready to either help or, or accept my response. Um, from simple things to major things, but the fact that individuals are wanting to step up and help is important to me. And the fact that I can help them do that. Um, one of the things we've done in NERSA and here on campus, we created a, a for lack of a better word, a white ally group, focus group, that individuals um, are, are seeking to help and how to help. And, and the fact that they're seeking help tells a lot to me, but actions have to be put behind it. Mm. Um, to stay um, uh, mouthpiece, it, it's action, action needs to be put behind it. And then uh, also, Don't take my responses is that I'm being too sensitive about it. Allow me to tell you, hey, I think that's offensive and it bothers me. Or don't think I'm overreacting about a situation. Um, so um, again, the fact that individuals are asking tells me a lot, but from my response, I have to be very transparent with them and tell them, this is where I need you. I need your voice. I need you to speak up. I need you to, if you see something wrong, say something's wrong with that statement. In the classroom, in the streets, in the rec center, wherever, student union, if it's wrong, speak up that it's wrong. Don't go talk to the water cooler about it. Say, hey, I think this was, you know, wrong. No, speak up. That's wrong. And let the people know it shouldn't just be my voice telling you it's wrong. If you think it's wrong, it probably is. And I need you to say something on my behalf to say, hey, I think that's wrong and go for it. That's just my opinion, my, my two cent opinion. Makes sense. Thanks for that. Uh, I wanna to get to a question from Chad Moore. Um, um, Chad is a graduate resident assistant who supervises other resident assistants uh, at a large university in Boston. Uh, Boston is a relatively politically progressive city and because of this, I encounter many students and staff uh, who believe that racism exists out there but not necessarily in here. Have you encountered this attitude before? And if so, do you have any advice for getting people to see and work to correct racist policies and dynamics within their own institutions and better support our black students who are frustrated by them? There's a lot to the question. There's a lot there. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I was about to say. There's a lot there. Um, so first I'll talk about the, the racism exists out there, not in here comment. I have encountered that a few times in my many, many years, but I think what's important is to give concrete examples. Sometimes some folks don't really work on arbitrary examples because we're not making it relevant to where they are. 
right? So until someone makes it relevant to where they are, then they have that aha moment. So sometimes you won't be able to connect with them on that. But what I've found is that doing individual type of trainings or individual type of having individual conversations and getting people to see that piece usually helps them have those aha moments. And I think some people, there's a fine line between racism and, and prejudice too. So while some folks may think something is racism in their minds, they don't think it's racism. But if you throw sometimes the word prejudice, then sometimes for some reason, they're more, they're more apt to either accept it or understand that it exists. So even, so language is important, really important to a, to a lot of people. The other piece I have is, is from a support standpoint, sometimes when we get these bias incident reports, we see that there's really more work to be done for the people that are reporting than for the people that it's being reported on because the people that are reporting, they need that support. So it's, it's being there for them, getting them to understand that sometimes we just can't change the way someone thinks, but what we can do is address it and make them aware of it. And then making sure they're feeling heard. And I, I, I see that often where that's that thing, that, that key ingredient for some folks who really are frustrated by these things, they don't feel supported and they don't feel heard. So definitely making sure that those black students are understanding and they're seeing that they are heard and that there are things being done. There's some awareness that's happening. There's conversations that are happening. Getting two people in the room that are on two opposite ends of the spectrum sometimes is where you, you get the most change that, that happens. Makes sense. Anyone else? I'll just add, try to get some buy-in from um, administration and, and try to, um, you know, change always works better if it's top down versus bottom up. I think that we get tired from the bottom if we continue to work without any change from the top. So if there is some ability to, to pull in systems um, that can be helpful to you, other campus partners, um, so that it feels like this is a collaborative um, system and so that if there's some areas where maybe um, other campus partners can kind of help out. Um, but I think having it uh, be a system, and that might mean that you, you know, might have to identify yourself and have to put yourself out there and, and try to find those connections. Uh, but I think that that would be helpful in terms of creating um, some space for that. I, I want to thank you for that. I have to say, the time has flown, and y'all have been dropping nuggets of wisdom but we have come to the point where i wish we could continue on and just have another set of hours to be able to talk about this um i want to give you all an opportunity to um share some final comments um and um, as you share your final comments um just talk about um, what's the biggest takeaway for you or the biggest takeaways today that you'd like for us to remember as we go through this so sean why don't we start with you Sorry. <laughs> there was one thing that um, we didn't mention that I just want the uh, audience to kind of remember is intersectionalities. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of individuals who are black students that might fit into other categories as well. And to also think about the impact that those um, additional um, concerns, LGBT community, um, you know, SES, all of those other kind of uh, different factors that might play a part in there. But I think my take home is the, the self-care piece again. Um, I really think that that's just the important piece. I don't think we do enough of it. And um, we know what stress does to the body and to the mind. And so just making sure that we're the strongest that we can be um, for ourselves, but then also for everyone that we work with. Thank you for that. Andrea? I think my, my nugget, I always like to tell folks when I facilitate, if, if just, here, just if you just grab one nugget of what I'm saying, and my, my nugget will be find a group of people where you can fill each other's cups. Because that is, that is, that is that, that's going to be that critical piece. If you are continuing to do this work and to be in it and, to, and you are Black, 
you need to find someone to to fill your fill your cup and know when you need know when your cup is empty thank you david um i think my biggest takeaway from this is one that people want to help and i appreciate that people want to help um be be comfortable being uncomfortable uh Hobson said and i put it in the chat you know, be, be okay to ask the questions, be okay with making yourself a little uncomfortable to ask the question to make things right or make things better. Um, I, I think what we've gone through in life or what we've gone through in society so far is it's up to us to make it better. And we have to make that change internally and externally, but we have to be okay doing it. And if we're, we're going to get frustrated. We're going to get angry. We're going to we're going to be sad. We're, we're going to show those vulnerabilities, and it's okay. That's it. Very good. Thank you. And we're going to have to leave it there. I I just want to say thank you, Sean, Andrea, David. Thank you for your time and for your wisdom and for what you have shared today. We know that there is so many different things that are going on right now. Uh, at a very, uh, a very, very heavy time. And so we just want to thank you for the time uh, and the knowledge that you've shared with us. And to all of you out there, I want to thank you for joining us today and spending some time with us as well. And hopefully um, um, through this round table, you've been able to get some of your questions answered and get uh, some perspective on what this uh, is a very important topic of how we support each other as black community members and support our students and staff. With that, thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Holly. Thank you so much, Olin and panelists. Um, before we kind of head off here, um, I want to make sure that everyone in the audience knows that um, over the next three weeks, we'll have some other programs within the series. Um, we have one dedicated to supporting professional staff, supporting students, and then supporting Black, Indigenous, and or people of color, uh, really honoring kind of that intersectionality that Dr. Bloom spoke about. Um, we hope that many on this call will continue to join us as we move along in this series, and thank you for being here. Um, again, a big thank you to our panelists um, and for Olin for his amazing moderation and leadership on this. Um, on behalf of Akulai Nursa and AUCCCO, we look forward to seeing you soon in the virtual space. Thank you very much and take care.